Nothing went as planned after D-Day. It took three days to form a bridgehead the other side of the Merdere at La Fiere, and another three days to link up with Omar Beach at Carantan. Now they could concentrate on Cherbourg. Now while the fighting at La Fiere and taking Carantan was going on, the troops from Omar Beach were advancing towards Saint Lo. And by the 17th of June, they'd got three quarters of the way there. And then they were told to stop. So the 29th, 2nd and 30th Division went into active defence, which practically means stop where you are. Three infantry divisions were involved in taking Cherbourg. The 4th, the 9th and the 79th. Now the 4th assaulted Duta Beach on D-Day. In the evening of the 6th, the 90th started coming in. And the 9th started land on the 10th and the 79th on the 12th. Now the original plan for taking Cherbourg was that the 90th and the 4th would attack it. Now the 90th started off helping the Airborne to install the bridgehead at La Fiere and it became evident that they weren't moving too well. So after taking Cherbourg, the 79th were fighting alongside the 90th to attack the Melman line. You see that video? Now the original plan to attack Cherbourg was to go directly from Utah Beach towards Cherbourg. Now von Schlieben had foreseen that, so there was a formidable line of defences from Kinneville on the coast, right up there, to Montbourg inland and across to La Hamme. On the 9th of June, General Bradley changed tack and decided to outflank Montbourg. So the 90th was set to cross the peninsula to cut it off. So the bridgehead had been established after three days with the 82nd and the 90th were helping them out once they crossed there and at Chef Dupont. <laughs> The bridgehead on the west bank of the murder had just been established after three days of fighting at La Fiere. Cutting off the peninsula would, for one thing, trap the Germans around Cherbourg. It would also stop reinforcements coming up to towards Cherbourg. The command of the 90th had to be changed because the men weren't moving. General Collins saw 90th men hiding in foxholes instead of advancing. So General McKelvey was changed for General Ludlam. But there still wasn't the solution, because later on it was changed again for General McLean. Lieutenant Kaufman of the 9th Division, who'd worked alongside the 90th, he had an idea as to why the 90th didn't advance. He said the 9th men wouldn't take any notice of snipers or mortars, they'd just carry on towards their objectives. The 9th Division, commanded by General Eddy, was set to lead the spearhead of crossing the peninsula. The 90th Division moved westwards from Pont l'Abbé and then northwest towards Gorbesville. The 82nd were heading towards saint sauveur le vicomte which is where we are now. They were going so fast that their supporting artillery shells were falling amongst them. On the 16th they took saint sauveur and the 9th joined them. Von Schlieben had already seen the writing on the wall. The 709th with part of the 243rd and some of the 77th came under the command of von Schlieben around Cherbourg and most of the 243rd, 77th and 91st came under General Helmich and they were to defend the west coast of the peninsula with a view to retreating southwards. One of the main reasons for this choice was that Cherbourg didn't have enough ammunition or food for four divisions. On top of Hill 145, just west of Saint Pierre d'Artiglis, not far from Barneville, is this German bunker. And from the sign over the door, it must have been a Luftwaffe bunker.
Mm, not very far, it's flooded. Now this is Hill 145 near Saint Jacques de Neu. Saint Jacques de Neu was taken on morning of the 17th, and then this high ground on Hill 145. From here, the artillery could pound the Germans who were trying to get out between them and the coast, which is just the other side of the horizon there. The 9th were advancing so well that General Collins told them to keep going through the night without stopping to get to Barneville. That humming sound is wind turbines. As there's no restaurants open, brought a picnic with me today. Wonder when all this COVID will disappear. Now if you appreciate these videos, you can help the channel in several ways. The easiest way is an early like. A bit late now, if you haven't already done it. The other way is to share the video, make comments, or buy me a few gallons of diesel. These videos take at least two days. Rarely do them in one. And this one's 400 kilometers for two days. Bayer to Cherbourg and back, Bayer to Barneville and back. Or you can join Patreon or buy uh, books on Amazon that I suggest in the description. Hope these sandwiches are okay. Hmm, bon appetit. That's good to have a bit of sustenance. Now back on track. The 3rd Battalion of the 60th Regiment was advancing through the night they should have taken the D-130 to swing round and come towards Barneville from the north, which is that way. But they kept on the D-42, so ended up coming into Barneville from the southeast. They, they went through Hamelville at 2 a.m. They got here at 5 a.m. next to the monument which of course wasn't there at the time. So it says here on the 18th of June 1944, the 9th Division of the 7th Corps of the 1st Army American, General Bradley realised the cutting off of the Cotonton Peninsula. You can see the sea over there. But their navigation mistake was actually a lucky chance because if they'd gone the way they should have gone they would have run into a big group of German soldiers. But coming this way they faced little opposition. Just by the monument which is near that gothic looking water tower I saw there's a green sign on the wall saying there's a Commonwealth graves in here or grave. And this is it. Not surprisingly, it's a Air Force man, Sergeant Thornton. Every now thoughts, Mum, Dad, and Alan. Also, notice there's some First World War French graves. Nineteen fifteen. Nineteen seventeen. Twenty two years old. And nineteen seventeen. Verdun. I just noticed in the distance. Those wind turbines, that's Hill 145 where we were. So you see how close it is to Barneville. 
So the artillery had a good field of fire onto the Germans trying to escape. The Barneville seemed to be empty of Germans, but they had to occupy it to be sure. But first they just rounded up a few German military police. But 15 minutes later, Germans started coming in from the outside, trying to get through the town. Luckily they weren't coming in a big group. So there's a bit of fighting, but mostly they just rounded up prisoners. By the evening of the 18th, the peninsula was cut. Lazy Sunday afternoon. This house in Barneville has a claim to fame. There's a plaque on there. It says both General Patton and Eisenhower stayed here in July 44. Now from Monburg, looking back down the N13, just over the horizon is the Mary Glees. By the 18th, the 9th Division had taken Barneville and cut off the peninsula. In the video on the advance on Saint Lo, the 2nd, 29th, and 30th Divisions have been told to go into active defence, i.e., stay where you are. All resources are going to be concentrated on Sherbrooke. The second plan of the 4th Division going towards Sherbrooke with the 9th was revised again. The newly arrived 79th Division was added on to go up the centre of the peninsula. The Allies had good information on the positions of the German defences, but they weren't too sure about the effectives. They could be between 20 to 40,000. The attack was launched on the 19th. The 9th Division headed towards the high ground between Ranville, Le Bigot and saint germain le gaillard The 79th passed through the 90th to advance towards the high ground northwest of Valoigne and the 4th north to Montbourg, which is where we are now. The 4th Division had been attempting to take Montbourg since the 12th. Three attacks had been realised. There had been four bombing raids plus naval artillery bombardment onto the town. On the 19th, the 8th Regiment took the high land to the west and the 12th to the right. The Germans had abandoned Montbourg, but the Americans found the town in ruins. Most civilians had left, but the soldiers were surprised to see around 200 civilians come out of their cellars. By the end of the 19th, the front line went from Helleville to Huberville. On the 19th, it was the troops on the west that were falling back, the German troops. On the 20th, it was the German troops in the west that fell back. The line was entered on the 20th and they found it in the same state of ruins as Montbourg. Just north of Valoigne, the 314th Regiment picked up four paratroopers who had been misdropped and they'd been hiding since the 6th. As General Collins didn't have much information about the quality or the quantity of the German soldiers in the area. He instructed the troops to do probing patrols to find out all this information. On the night of the 21st of June, General Collins sent a message to von Schlieben that he should surrender. Von Schlieben refused. So they were going to have to fight their way into Sherbrooke. A bad storm had blown up in the channel on the 19th. That had wrecked the Mulberry Harbour at Omar Beach. They also stopped the supplies coming in for three days. So capturing Sherbrooke became even more urgent now. On the 22nd of June, bombing raids were carried out against the German defences by the RAF and the USAF. Now these, uh, because they were badly coordinated with the ground troops, there were casualties amongst the Americans in the west with the 9th Division and in the east with the 4th Division. It was partly due to the coloured smoke of the markers drifting due to the wind. Of course that's what happened in Operation Cobra. The uh, 12th Regiment of the 4th Division was to take the Bois de Coudre, which is up here, and Lieutenant Colonel Dullin was leading the attack. He was shot by a sniper. So Major Linda took command. Now tanks were used to help the men advance. 
Scouts will go ahead and see where there might be Panzer Shreks or anything doubtful. The tank will come up, either spray it with a machine gun or eliminate it with a blast of a 75mm. The sight of the tanks would often make the Germans flee as they had no means of countering them. The first V1s had been launched towards Britain on the 13th of June. There were dozens of V1 launching sites in the Cotentin. Thanks to Allied bombing raids and the fact that from the 6th of June the Americans were heading towards Cherbourg, none of them were ever used. This one is not far from Le Bois Caudre, just southwest of Cherbourg. The 79th were advancing along the N13, which is the main road into Cherbourg. There were some prepared defences just along here. They've disappeared now. The 1st Battalion attacking these defences was stopped by the defences until the 3rd Battalion came round on the flank and overcame the German defences. You can see on these ridges the Germans had a good command of the terrain to the south, <coughs> although they couldn't withstand the sheer pressure of the advance. Just about a mile up the road there were some more defences. The 314th skirted round them and carried on their advance and those defences were taken the next day. The 9th Division in the west was attacking Octaville. Taking Hill 171 used up the last resources of the German defences. On the 23rd, von Schlieben took over from General Sattler as the commander of the Sherbourg garrison. This caused more problems because messages that should have been sent to von Schlieben now were still being sent to General Sattler. Hitler told von Schlieben that in the last ditch he must not leave a usable port for the Allies if he had to surrender. Von Schlieben asked for reinforcements. Now this was of course impossible. There was the 15th parachuters in Somalo, but bringing them by sea was impossible because the Allies were masters of the sea and bringing them by air was impossible for the same reason. So no more reinforcements to come. Von Schlieben was inundated with reports from the outlying bunkers. The commanders were saying that there was Americans everywhere and they couldn't even get out of their bunkers because the Americans had barricaded the doors. Von Schlieben gave them permission to surrender. Now the Germans did evacuate most of the civilians from Cherbourg. The, there was 40,000 inhabitants and about 6,000 remained. The Germans did bring in lots of cattle getting ready for a long siege. By the 24th, most of the outlying bunkers had been overcome. Near La Glasserie, the 8th Regiment noticed a strange tactic by the Germans. They went past what they thought were dead bodies and the Germans were pretending to be dead. The idea was they were going to spring up behind the Americans. But their ruse was discovered and most of these dead Germans surrendered. The American troops were now entering the streets of Cherbourg, but just a few men in the town could hold up the advance. And the guns here were firing on the town. Von Schlieben was playing for time. He needed time for the port to be destroyed, and also he wanted to inflict as many casualties on the Americans so that once they turned southwards, there'd be less of them to turn. This is Fort Rule overlooking Cherbourg. It was built by the French in the 19th century to counter any attack from the English from the sea. Now the Germans used it and added to it during the war. It was finally taken on the 25th. Now the 314th Regiment of the 79th Division were attacking from inland, which is more or less the same height as this, so it was defended by bunkers. The 2nd Battalion was attacking them and the 3rd Battalion came up to give them support. Lieutenant Carlos Ogden fired a rifle grenade and that destroyed an 88mm gun. The lower levels were still active and they could still fire into the town. On the 26th the American troops started entering the streets of the town. By mid-afternoon the 79th had reached the beach. 
Our progress was still hampered by the guns at Fort Rule, which were down the side of these cliffs. They were overcome by a system a bit like depth charges in the air. The Americans lowered some explosives down to the level of the gun ports and they detonated the explosives at that level. They also put explosives down the ventilation shafts and finally the men surrendered. The 9th Division was attacking to the east, attacking this fort of Toe, which is a 19th century fort built by the French. Now E Company of the 47th attacked it. They laid down a barrage of mortars and there was a bombing attack and then they stormed across the entrance and by 11 o'clock 70 men surrendered. The 4th Division advanced rapidly from the west and the southwest. They took the Fort Flamont, which marked the land end of the breakwater. The Germans started to surrender when they saw tanks destroying bunkers at point blank range. On the 25th of June there was a land to sea battle between the Hamburg battery and seven American ships, including two battleships. The battery covered the approach to Cherbourg so it had to be silenced before any Allied ships could enter the port. The Arkansas opened up at 12.08. The battery waited till the ships were in range, then opened up at 12.29. Several ships were hit, but with no serious damage. The gun of the battery was destroyed. At 1500 hours, the ships pulled back. The Texas and the Arkansas had fired over 260 shells battery surrendered on the 28th of June. The British participated in this attack. The number 30 commando assault unit landed by sea, which of course is down there, and they were to attack Villa Morris, which was the headquarters of Rear Admiral Henneke. The idea was to steal an Enigma machine and code books. So this is the villa, still there today. Rear Admiral Henneke surrendered on the 27th with General von Schlieben. Henneke was awarded the Iron Cross by Hitler for his destruction of the port. Even the Americans says it was a masterpiece of destruction. It took over a month to get it working again. And the 9th Division were working into the west side of the town and von Schlieben's headquarters was in this area. And they only found out where it was thanks to some information from the prisoner and they found the tunnel entrance. They sent the prisoner in to tell von Schlieben to surrender and he still refused so they fired a few shells from tanks into the tunnel and a few minutes later 800 men came out. Now this is where it was, nothing left really. Now that grey roof is the roof of Villa Morris where Rear Admiral Henniker was, that the British commandos attacked. And just here, you can see there's a bunker there. That's all that's left of the HQ of von Schlieben. Everything was underground. It's all been obliterated by this development. Just one bunker left. There was still the arsenal holding out. Colonel Smythe sent some men of the 47th Regiment to try and get the men to surrender and they weren't going to surrender. General Sattler, who was now in here, he sent the message saying that he couldn't surrender to the infantry, he could surrender to tanks. So Colonel Smythe got some tanks to send a few salvos onto the walls and the men inside surrendered. This bunker's still in place because it's right near the port, not right in the way of anything. That used to be the transatlantic liner terminal, now it's the cruise terminal. That was badly damaged. But to make the port unusable, what the Germans did was demolish buildings and then bulldoze rubble into the water by the quays. 
so you couldn't get a ship up to the quay even if you could get in and then they blocked the entrances to the harbour these block ships sunk that's why it took so long to sort it out it was British engineers and Americans to the east of Cherbourg the 22nd regiment had taken the airport but the strong point of Ostek was still holding out the 27th and Major Coopers refused to surrender on the morning of the 28th General Barton went up in the jeep with a white flag to talk to Coopers Barton talked about his time near Coopers hometown in World War One but that didn't seem to affect him then he took out a map and showed the map to Coopers it was a detailed map of the strong point showing the precise positions of all the bunkers and the names of all the officers seeing that his enemy knew everything about him this convinced Coopers to surrender he also told the men to demine the roads going up to the position he later said that his decision was influenced by tanks to the right to the left in front and troops everywhere now this is the observation post to guide the Battery of Hamburg which was in that sea battle or naval battle with the Texas and the Arkansas and destroyers taking Cherbourg it cost the Americans 22,000 casualties of which 2,800 were killed over 20,000 prisoners were taken Thanks for watching to the end. To support the channel, you can subscribe, it's free, or there are other ideas in the description. The maps I use come from Master Vector Map that scales from this to this. A link is in the description.